the ones who walk away from Amalas. Burris Le Guin. With a clamor of bells that set the swallows soaring, the festival of summer came to the city Amalus. Bright towered by the sea, the ringing of the boats in the harbor sparkled with flags. In the streets between houses with red roofs and painted walls, between old moss-grown gardens and under avenues of trees, past great parks and public buildings, processions moved. Some were decorous, old people in long, stiff robes of mauve and gray, grave master workmen, quiet, merry women carrying their babies and chatting as they walked. In other streets, the music beat faster, a shimmering of gong and tambourine, and the people went dancing. The procession was a dance. Children dodged in and out, their high calls rising like the swallows crossing flight over the music and the singing. All the processions wound towards the north side of the city, where the great water meadow called the Greenfields. Boys and girls, naked in the bright air, with mud-stained feet and ankles and long, lithe arms, exercised their restive horses before the race. The horses wore no gear at all, but a halter without a bit. Their manes were braided with streamers of silver, gold, and green. They flared their nostrils and pranced and boasted to one another. They were vastly excited, the horses being the only animal who has adopted our ceremonies as his own. Far off to the north and the west, the mountains stood up, half encircling Amalus on her bay. The air of the morning was so clear that the snow still crowning the eighteen peaks burned with white gold fire across the miles of sunlit air under the dark blue of the sky. There was just enough wind to make the banners that marked the race course snap and flutter now and then. In the silence of the broad green meadows, one could hear the music winding through the city streets. Farther and nearer than ever approaching, a cheerful faint sweetness of the air from time to time trembled and gathered together and broke out into the great joyous clinging of the bells. Joyous. How is one to tell about joy? How describe the citizens of Amalus? They were not simple folk, you see, though they were happy. But we do not say the words of cheer much any more. All smiles have become archaic. Given a description such as this, one tends to make certain assumptions. Given a description such as this, one tends to look next for the king, mounted on a splendid stallion and surrounded by his noble knights, or perhaps in a golden litter, borne by great muscled slaves. But there was no king. They did not use swords or keep slaves. They were not barbarians. I do not know the rules and laws of their society, but I suspect that there were singularly few. As they did without monarchy and slavery, so they also got on without the stock exchange, the advertisement, the secret police, and the bomb. Yet, I repeat that these were not simple folk, not dulcet shepherds, noble savages, bland utopians. They were not less complex than us. The trouble is that we have a bad habit, encouraged by pedants and sophisticates, of considering happiness as something rather stupid. Only pain is intellectual, only evil interesting. This is treason of the artist, a refusal to admit the banality of evil and the terrible boredom of pain. If you can't lick them, join them. If it hurts, repeat it. But to praise despair is to condemn delight. To embrace violence is to lose hold of everything else. We have almost lost hold. We can no longer describe a happy man, nor make any celebration of joy. How can I tell you about the people of Amalus? They were not naive and happy children, though their children were, in fact, happy. They were mature, intelligent, passionate adults whose lives were not wretched. Oh, miracle. But I wish I could describe it better. I wish I could convince you. Amalus sounds, in my words, like a city in a fairy tale, long ago and far away once upon a time. Perhaps it would be best if you imagined it as your own fancy bids, assuming it will rise to the occasion, for certainly, I cannot suit you all. For instance, how about technology? I think that there would be no cars or helicopters in and above the streets. This follows from the fact that the people of Amalus are happy people. Happiness is based on... Happiness is based on a just discrimination of what is necessary, what is neither necessary nor destructive and what is destructive. In the middle category, however, that of the unnecessary but undestructive, that of comfort, luxury, exuberance, etc. They could perfectly well have central heating, 
subway trains, washing machines, and all kinds of marvelous devices not yet invented here. Floating light sources, fuelless power, a cure for the common cold. Or they could have none of that. It doesn't matter. As you like it, I incline to think that people from towns up and down the coast have been coming to Amalus during the last days before the festival, on very fast little trains and double-decked trams and that the train station of Amelus is actually the handsomest building in town, though plainer than the magnificent farmer's market. But even granted trains, I fear that Amelus so far strikes some of you as a goody-good. Smiles, bells, parades, horses, blah. If so, please add an orgy. If an orgy would help, don't hesitate. Let us not, however, have temples from which issue beautiful nude priests and priestesses. Already half in ecstasy, and ready to copulate with any man or woman, lover or stranger, who desires union with the deep godhead of the blood. Although that was my first idea. But really, it would be better not to have any temples in Omelus. At least, not manned temples. Religion, yes. Clergy, no. Surely, the beautiful nudes can just wander about, offering themselves like divine souffles to the hunger of the needy and the rapture of the flesh. Let them join the processions. Let tambourines be struck above the copulations, and the gory of desire be proclaimed upon the gongs. And, a not important point, let the offspring of these delightful rituals be beloved and looked after by all. One thing I know, there is none of an ominous guilt. But what else should there be? I thought at first there were no drugs, but that is puritanical. For those who like it, the faint, insistent sweetness of Druze may perfume the ways of the city. Druze, which first brings a great lightness and brilliance to the mind and limbs, and then after some hours, a dreamy linger, and wonderful visions at last of the very arcane and inmost secrets of the universe, as well as exciting the pleasure of sex beyond all belief. And it's not habit-forming. For more modest taste, I think there ought to be beer. What else? What else belongs in the joyous city? The sense of victory, surely. The celebration of courage, but as we did without clergy, let us do without soldiers. The joy built upon successful slaughter is not the right kind of joy. It will not do. It is fearful, and it is trivial. A boundless and generous contentment, a magnanimous triumph fell not against some outer enemy, but in communion with the finest and fairest in the souls of all men everywhere, and the splendor of the world's summer. This is what swells the hearts of the people of Amalus and the victory they celebrate is that of life. I don't think many of them need to take Druze. Most of the processions have reached the green fields by now. A marvelous smell of cooking goes forth from the red and blue tents of the provisioners. The faces of small children are amiably sticky, and the benign, gray beard of a man, a couple of crumbs of rich pastry are entangled. The youths and girls have mounted their horses and are beginning to group around the starting line of the course. An old woman, small, fat, and laughing, is passing out flowers from a basket, and tall young men wear her flowers in their shining hair. A child of nine or ten sits at the edge of the crowd alone, playing on a wooden flute. People pause to listen, and they smile. But they do not speak to him, for he never ceases playing, and never sees them, his dark eyes wholly wrapped in the sweet, thing magic of the tune. He finishes and slowly lowers his hands, holding the wooden flute. As if that little private silence were the signal, all at once a trumpet sounds from the pavilion near the starting line. Imperious, melancholy, piercing. The horses rear on their slender legs, and some of them neigh in answer. Sober-faced, the young rider strokes the horse's neck and soothes them, whispering, Quiet, quiet there, my beauty, my hope. They began to form in rank along the starting line. The crowds along the race course are like a field of grass and flowers in the wind. The festival of summer has begun. Do you believe? Do you accept the festival, the city, the joy? No. Then let me describe one more thing. In a basement, under one of the beautiful public buildings of Amelus, or perhaps in the cellar of one of its spacious private homes, there is a room. It has one locked door and no window. A little light seeps in dustily between the cracks and the boards. Second hand from a cobwebbed window somewhere across the cellar. 
In one corner of the little room, a couple of mops with stiff, clotted, foul-smelling heads stand near a rusty bucket. The floor is dirt, a little damp to the touch, as the cellar dirt usually is. The room is about three paces long and two wide. A mere broom closet or a disused tool room. In the room, a child is sitting. It could be a boy or a girl. It looks about six, but actually is nearly ten. It is feeble-minded. Perhaps it was born defective, or perhaps it has become imbecile through fear, malnutrition, and neglect. It picks its nose and occasionally fumbles vaguely with its toes or genitals, as it sits hunched in the corner farthest from the bucket and the two mops. It is afraid of the mops. It finds them horrible. It shuts its eyes, but it knows the mops are still standing there, and the door is locked, and nobody will come. The door is always locked, and nobody ever comes, except that sometimes. The child has no understanding of time or interval. Sometimes the door rattles terribly and opens, and a person, or several people, are there. One of them may come in and kick the child to make it stand up. The others never come close but peer in at it with frightened, disgusted eyes. The food bowl and water jug are hastily filled. The door is locked. The eyes disappear. The people at the door never say anything. But the child, who has not always lived in the tool room, can remember sunlight and its mother's voice. Sometimes speaks. I will be good, it says. Please let me out. I will be good. They never answer. The child used to scream for help at night and a cry a good deal, but now it only makes a kind of whining, yeah, yeah, and it speaks less and less often. It is so thin there are no calves to its legs, its belly protrudes, it lives on a half bowl of cornmeal and grease a day. It is naked. Its buttocks and thighs are a mass of festered sores as it sits in its own excrement continually. They all know it is there, all the people of Omelus. Some of them have come to see it. Others are content merely to know it is there. They all know that it has to be there. Some of them understand why, and some do not. But they all understand that their happiness, the beauty of their city, the tenderness of their friendships, the health of their children, the wisdom of their scholars, the skill of their makers, even the abundance of their harvest and the kindly weathers of their skies depend wholly on this child's abominable misery. This is usually explained to children whenever they're between 8 and 12, whenever they seem capable of understanding, and most of those who come to see the child are young people, though often enough an adult comes or comes back to see the child. No matter how well the matter has been explained to them, these young spectators are always shocked and sickened at the sight. They feel disgust, which they had thought themselves superior to. They feel anger, outrage, impotence, despite all the explanations. They would like to do something for the child, but there's nothing they can do. If the child were brought up into the sunlight out of that vile place, if it were cleaned and fed and comforted, that would be a good thing indeed. But if it were done, in that day, an hour, all the prosperity and beauty and delight of Amalus would wither and be destroyed. Those are the terms. To exchange all the goodness and grace of every life in Amalus for that single, small improvement. To throw away the happiness of thousands for the chance of happiness of one, that would be to let guilt within the walls indeed. The terms are strict and absolute. There may not even be a kind word spoken to the child. Often the people go home in tears or in a tearless rage when they have seen the child and faced this terrible paradox. They may brood over it for weeks or years, but as time goes on, they begin to realize that even if the child could be released, it would not get much good of its freedom. A little vague pleasure of warmth and food, no real doubt, but little more. It is too degraded and imbecile to know any real joy. It has been afraid too long ever to be free of fear. Its habits are too uncouth for it to respond to humane treatment. Indeed, after so long it would probably be wretched without walls about it to protect it, and darkness for its eyes, and its own excrement to sit in. Their tears at the bitter injustice dry when they begin to perceive the terrible justice of reality and to accept it. Yet, it is their tears and anger, the trying of their generosity and the acceptance of their helplessness 
which are perhaps the truest source of the splendor of their lives. Theirs is no vapid, irresponsible happiness. They know that they, like the child, are not free. They know compassion. It is the existence of the child, in their knowledge of its existence, that makes possible the nobility of their architecture, the poignancy of their music, the profundity of their science. It is because of the child that they are so gentle with children. They know that, if the wretched one were not there, sniveling in the dark, the other one, the flute player, could make no joyful music as the young riders line up in their beauty for the race in the sunlight of the first morning of summer. Now, do you believe them? Are they not more credible? But there's one thing to tell, and it is quite incredible. At times, one of the adolescent girls or boys who go see the child does not go home to weep or rage, does not in fact go home at all. Sometimes also a man or a woman much older falls silent for a day or two, then leaves home. These people go out into the street and walk down the street alone. They keep walking and walk straight out of the city of Amalus. Through the beautiful gates, they keep walking across the farmlands of Amalus. Each one goes alone, youth or girl, man or woman. Night falls. The traveler must pass down village streets between the houses with yellow lead windows and on out into the darkness of the fields. Each alone, they go west or north, towards the mountains. They go on. They leave Omelus. They walk ahead into the darkness, and they do not come back. The place they go towards is a place even less imaginable to most of us than the city of happiness. I cannot describe it at all. It is possible that it does not exist. But they seem to know where they are going. The ones who walk away from Omelus. So that story is pretty good. I like those kind of stories. I like the writing style in particular, where it's kind of just, you know, highly detailed and then not so much and kind of hits on a bunch of certain points. If you get it, you get it. If you don't, you don't. It's not really about writing as an exercise to just write the classic having a point kind of thing, right? I think there's a lot of different interpretations that can be gleaned from the story. Uh, I'm leaning towards two, so I'm not just sitting here talking for hours on end about speculating on this. The main two, one of them being a principle of there's no pleasure without pain, no pleasure without suffering of some sort, whether it be from the individual experiencing the pleasure or in an outwardly, outwardly sense where the outside world is what experiences it, while the benefactors get to, you know, just revel in the glory of that. Another one, could be a weird, uh, I guess, acknowledgement. Oh wait, I guess it's pretty much the same thing. Never mind, I lied. I'm, I'm thinking of like a soldier's burden. You get your sacrifice so that everyone else uh, can live freely. And most of us know this is true in the case of freedom and uh, luxury, that something has to go into it. Something has to give to maintain it. So I guess that's essentially really the same thing. It's not really two different ones. Just organizing my stones. In particular, in the modern world, I always think of uh, outsourcing labor. Not to go on some big leftist spiel or whatever, but a lot of the times, convenience, extreme convenience, specifically than not necessarily luxury, is at the cost of someone else doing it in not a comfortable or convenient way. Things you can think of is like cheap plastic goods that are readily available at a, like a Dollar General or something where that stuff is not produced usually in the country where it's being sold and it's mass produced somewhere else often for like penny labor it seems like um, which is it's always interesting on a uh, moral standing because the people that benefit most from that outside of the consumer, like the people who sell the products or whatever. Oh, it looks pretty good, sorry. The people that sell the product don't really, you know, trickle down, if you will, to the benefits of that. If you ever go to like Business Insider, and I don't know how much of that's political schlock, 
where they're trying to skew it a certain way, but they'll show stuff like salt mines or sulfur. Sulfur minerals. Where it's like harvested by hand. But over here it's like relatively cheap for how much labor goes into it, how dangerous it is. I'm just making sure I'm checking all these out. And so, in my opinion, some like second world or third world country or whatever the term is these days, uh, being exploited for labor is like the child in the closet where short of purposely being ignorant, you, uh, we all know that someone's suffering so that we can, you know, celebrate and have our uh, jubilee, if you will. And some people feel really bad about it. And I, that's why I speculate on the end of the story where the people walk off into the mountains. If that's, uh, if it's, I mean, some of it could just be literal symbolism, but I, I could take that one very literally. Um, you see that with movements where people want to go off grid. Some of it's uh, anti-government, tired of paying taxes kind of stuff, and some of it's just like, I don't like society and what society has become. Which, to be fair, is not a new phenomenon. Uh, people have been experiencing that forever, uh, to different degrees. Whether you got some philosopher living in the sewer, rejecting societal norms, or some uh, mountain man living off the land. You know, a country boy can survive type B. I speculate two things. One, they're going out there just to die in the wilderness where they feel like the injustice is like too great to just pretend and deal with or accept as a necessary sacrifice, if you will. Which is always easy to do, uh, to accept it as a necessary sacrifice when it's not you on the line, right? Like, and that's a lot of times a mythos for different things. Uh, that's where the, the quality, if you will, of uh, somebody being heroic or brave comes from, is them choosing to sacrifice themselves for whatever cause or thought or idea. Uh, in this case, we'll go with the assumption that the author's uh, being genuine and it's not just like a religious almost subtext where it's just assumed things have to be done a certain way. Per perhaps it is true that that child has to be, you know, locked in the, the closet, the broom closet with the piss, bo with the piss bucket. Um, in order for their society to be so great and grand. So if we just assume that's true, then it's like that person has no control over their destiny and they just, they just get to suffer. That's where the bravery comes in. I always wonder in these kind of situations is like, would you rather, this is a personal question to anybody, would you rather live in a world where this kind of injustice is a requirement for everything to be good? Or would you rather live in one where you do the right thing or what you feel is right in this case? Because they admit that that's a feeling that people have where they feel bad seeing this child in this condition, in these circumstances for these reasons. Uh, would you rather live in a world where people would do what would be deemed the right thing, not by the code of law, or the moral grounds of that wall, but like of an actual, like personal moral. I don't know. Brothers. For myself personally, I think I would lean towards you get the kid out of there, uh, even if it means your whole world burns. Uh, and perhaps that's from the convenience of living in such a condition where I don't have much to lose <laughs> in that situation. So I feel like a world that requires this. If it all crumbles apart, probably shouldn't have been. And what can make that argument then in the real world, which has plenty of examples of stuff like this, like, I don't know, some like blood diamond mine thing going on there, or like child soldiers. Um, we kind of commit to the bit, so to speak. We accept it. We make it a part of the human experience for some people, not everyone. We can live you know, sequestered off somewhere safe, uh, untouched, if you will, by darkness, pain, starvation, filth. And in context, again, at the time the story was published, I believe the Vietnam War was going on. And so maybe that could also tie into that. Uh, this makes me think of a show I watched like 20 years ago called Xavier Renegade Angel. And they had a lot of mixed spiritual and philosophical ideas in it and there's episode we don't need to get into great details of the episode it was kind of spicy but 
They had a, a pill. Enough on your plate. Let Fiddlin' do the spiritual legwork for you. At Transcendental Medication, we sonically condense the biodharmic vibrations of over 1,000 monk chants into every pill. Science spirit uh. If not now, when? If not it, what? If not things, stuff? Side effects include wet. Who says you can't find purity in a pill? Tune in to Fiddlin' with your soul. It was essentially turning them into a market of a resource that could be extracted for peace. And then there's another episode that I think complemented that idea about uh, outsourcing suffering. Here. Every luxury has a deep price. Every indulgence, a cosmic cost. Each fiber of pleasure you experience causes equivalent pain somewhere else. This is the first law of hemodynamics. Joy can be neither created nor destroyed. The balance of happiness is constant. Fact. Don't be a pleasure hog. Your every smile is a dagger. Happiness is murder. Vote yes on Proposition 1231. Think of some kids. Some kids. This story kind of does that. Where... Here's a question. Would you rather one guy take all the suffering, all the pain, like some Jesus type figure, I guess, in this case. Uh, they take all of the, the bad, the ill, the mistreatment, the unlove, if you will. Or would you rather it be, you know, sprinkled out over a bunch of people? Or I guess in this world, in real life, would you like want it to just be a matter of perspective, I guess, in some circumstances? Uh, the story begs those kind of questions. It begs another question, like how different are we from that one? I know I'm harping on this a lot, just there is suffering, you know it's happening. Why not do anything about it? And then it answers that question, why we don't do anything about it? Because, hey, if I involve myself in this, things can get messy for me. So why would I mess with that? And then the other key element, I think, in that is the time they show you this, this uh, corruption, if you will, if you'd want to call it that, but in that world, it's probably just. Um, they show it to you at an age where you're not going to really think or reflect on it very much in a, in a meaningful way. You'll have your initial emotional reaction, of course, but then you'll just, you know, just embrace it. Well, everyone else around me is except for this. Why should I not? Why should I be different? And then you have the people who walk away. I do like the emphasis on on the society not being barbaric or like archaic or anything. Like they're they're just as civilized as us functionally, or whatever this piece was written. The, the argument being to live like this is not <laughs> demeaning or whatever in comparison. In, in my head, I think that whenever we do do those comparisons with like how a society might be structured, like expecting some sort of king or whatever, like the, the author gave a little hors d'oeuvre of why things are the way they are in that society, it kind of highlights that the technology and shit, it doesn't, doesn't really transfer away our ability to interact with each other the same way or as function as a society. Like you can have flying cars or whatever, but like you're still a human at the end of the day, you're still going to do human things. Um, technology seemingly only sometimes helps uh, inhibit, I guess, non-destructive pleasures, if you will, or advancing socially. Most of the time, well, I don't know. It depends on your perspective on this, which is, you know, that's philosophy, right? A lot of it's a matter of perspective, prescribed as if it is fact, or as the way things should or ought to be, right? But things like, I don't know, like farm equipment kind of like nullifies the necessity of having manual human labor for a lot of tasks. Uh, thus, getting rid of the desire or need to, you know, have things like slaves or undocumented workers or whatever the hell. Although people still do that, and now we just, you know, modernize it a little bit. And that's, that's up to you personally if you want to be doom or build about that or upset by it. Inevitably, we're going to have to... In my opinion, suffer no matter what. It's just how much suffering on the individual level and how much of it is you're, are you going to tolerate in a capacity that's not detrimental to your personal experience. Uh, if you're even afforded the option to have that perspective. I think it's a big issue in this too. Uh, why the, the, the child example works great to highlight like the darkness of this is the kid, is, it's implied the kid didn't do anything at all other than they're just chosen for this role. 
And I often wonder, back to the soldier parallel, I don't, although I think the person that wrote this was like very anti-war, but I, it still fits in that to me, that like how I'm seeing the narrative, maybe that's just a masculine thing, but, but like when uh, somebody on some D-Day thing, they're on the, you know, on the beach and all they see is just, you know, explosions and mortar and vines and all sorts of horrible, ghastly things. And if they even think that far, because all those people were really young too uh, at that time. If, if I can remember correctly, like the average age was like 18 or 19, maybe even younger. It might have actually been younger. That's crazy, isn't it? Like, think about that now when you're going to your childhood, if you're watching this like closer to my age or if you are like a teen or something like think about the, the that that idea of like being sent to war is not even on your mind ever this doesn't even cross it's not realistically not on there uh, specifically if you're american i guess but they're chosen for it <laughs> they have to endure it and everyone's allowed to look at it and witness it Gross. they get chosen for it and they can't even comprehend why and nobody explains it to them. And nobody's allowed to explain it to them. You're not supposed to. You're supposed to let them be in ignorance of it. And purposely allow it so that they can uh, deteriorate. I think that in the story, the, the word was uh, through neglect or malnutrition, allow them to become an imbecile. Uh, so that all they can understand and slowly wane away, wane away from is misery. And then, you know, crying turns to just a... Uh, and then it uh, just turns into a dead-eyed, probably fish-eyed look. I imagine the story continued on. I don't know what they do with them after a certain point. Um, they just kind of wither away patiently. There's no fighting back. There's no self-determination when they start you young enough to not even comprehend the option to get out of that situation. Even emphasize more some like determinism there where it's like you didn't even choose your fate. Like this was just given to you. Uh, so that everyone else can be, quote unquote, happy. But the joke would be is that they're not all happy. <laughs> like they're still, they're not all perfect. Because they're still, it seemingly, it seems like people still get the press seeing that. And that's like, that's the joke. Um, you can see that in other places in, in the real world again. Uh, I think specifically like veganism, where uh, if you haven't ever watched it, but every, well, every once in a while somebody will try to shock you with like slaughterhouse videos or uh, feedlot footage showing like how animals are treated before they're uh, disposed of for human consumption or other things and, and it's the alienation from the process so to speak and like that kid's getting the opposite of that but like also all these people still have some suffering otherwise they wouldn't feel that. I, in my opinion i don't think you would have that uh, emotional response I, I guess other than the shock factor i guess if you're sheltered but that's that's a different I don't know philosophically as much as just like a regular, um, if you don't experience something, you don't experience it. There's no, as the author even said, telling the stories, like, I wish I could relate to you in better words, what it was like or whatever. It would be the same as, you know, reading about tasting a lemon. If you've never had a lemon, the words will do you no justice to the actual experience, in my opinion, at least, unless they're really good at writing. Like they can... Uh, to trick your brain into tasting things that aren't there or maybe they are there. There's a flavor in your tongue But my main point being all the people are still suffering in some way shape or form. There's there's no Escaping that it's just this person's being kept in horrible conditions Seemingly for just the sake of doing it and everyone knows about it and nobody wants or thinks to do anything about it And that's probably again another real world parallel as like all stories are sci-fi or otherwise utopia or dystopia uh, that kind of explains like a lot of different problems where we kind of delegate this off to different groups of people to solve shit. Most of the time it's not the whole, you know, it says it takes a village to raise a child or whatever, but a lot of times we just like, <laughs> we leave people, we become very individualistic when it comes to problem solving certain types of problems, uh, be it violence or neglect or whatever in one way or another, not just children, but adults even. And then we delegate a portion of society, maybe you want to go like very literal, a little like the state or like police or doctors to solve this. Even though everyone knows people are quote unquote suffering. And so your only option is to leave, I guess, if you know it. At least that's what most people treat the option like. 
not to be all pessimistic, because I think realistically a lot of people approach these kinds of issues like, head on. Or they dedicate their entire life to it. Not everyone does that. I'm not in that camp of people that does. I'm very detached in that sense from most of the issues. Although I do fall into the camp where when it happens in my life, I kind of deal with it one way or another. Or at least pay lip service to it. Let's be honest here. Most of the time we know somebody's doing bad and we all try to like, hey, if you need anything. And not everyone actually follows up on that. In this case, I feel like most people in the modern time would find this deplorable. Because uh, I say that because people find things that aren't even like horrible, deplorable. So I'd imagine a call into action would be pretty quick. That's the dog working. Um, another thing, this uh, the story, this last tangent side note thing. Another thing the story reminded me of is a song by the Eagles called Last Resort. And... I can't remember exactly all the lyrics, but it's a good song. You should look it up. Uh, it's got it's a pretty long one though, so I would listen to it if you're just chilling. I wouldn't. It's not. It's not like a boner jam. You're not going to be dancing to this one. But it kind of tells the story of like a town. I I, I want to say it's like some Massachusetts or Colorado is what I envision, but like settlers kind of coming into a place, making it big and massive, expanding upon like a religious view they have, and adding. Uh, glamorous signage and cel jubilee and celebration about it only for it all to just be delusion which that could be the case in a lot of a lot of things that we deem necessary to justify our life or to make our society seem functional it kind of can go it can go a lot of directions with that but i'm gonna wrap it up here <laughs> i got other shit to do today i hope you have a good one uh, let me know if the audio is annoying or tedious. I was, I find that I spend too much time editing audio. I do have a lapel mic, it's just not charged. I just wanted to get this done uh, before prolonging it. I've listened to the story like four or five times and I've read it like three times myself. Kind of just let it sit in there for a little bit and stew. Let me know your thoughts on the story too in the comments below. Peace.